created Species Nutrition with one mission in mind, to provide bodybuilders and serious athletes with no-nonsense supplements that work. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. RxTelevision, RxMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. Bodybuilding, non-bodybuilding, diet, training, supplementation, anything and everything going on in the bodybuilding world, we got you covered. We're going to go right into the questions. We have a ton of questions to get to. The first two questions on the show from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Uh, would you always increase food when going off cycle and onto a PCT? Oh, I, I, the question is always increase food or decrease food? Increase food yeah. when you go off cycle and into, into a PCT. Well, I mean, if you're going off cycle, I guess, you know, into a, an off season, if you're in the off season and you're trying to grow and then you go off cycle, I don't know if I would increase food at that point. I'd probably keep, I would keep food the same so that you don't lose muscle, you know, obviously. Now, if you're dieting and then you go off cycle, and into like a like a maintenance off season you know type stage until you clean out for eight weeks and then go back on where you're going to try to grow. I would absolutely increase food from from a pre contest situation. Yeah, no no doubt. Um, how much I increase it, you know, I usually I usually start inching it up. You know, I start increasing it gradually. Some people have a crazy metabolism. I have to give them more food immediately. But if you're going from off season to off, then I would just keep it consistent. Second question, again, these questions, the first two questions from the Dave Palumbo Experience app, um, calls you Big Dave. Is it possible to compete, well, I mean, I guess it is, possible to compete two weeks in a row, example, June 1st and then again on June 8th? If so, will your carb up and water drop differ from the first show to the second or should you keep things the same? Yeah, I used to love competing week to week like that because it's so easy because, you know, you get off the first show. I usually have a cheat meal that Saturday night after the show. Sunday, I'm doing legs again and hydrating a lot. And then, you know, I'll de if, depending on how I look, if I'm in shape already, then I can probably coast. If I need to get a little tighter, then I might, you know, bang some more cardio Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then carb up after I, you know, either after I'm done with my last workout on Wednesday, do Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or some for some people, most people just do Thursday, Friday, and then Saturday you compete. So I definitely repeat the same schedule. Now, keep in mind from super hydrating and everything like that, you know, on, after that cheat meal on Sunday and Monday, you might be a little watery on Monday or Tuesday, you know. So that's normal. Don't start freaking out and start taking diuretics because you're going to screw yourself up. You want to let your body get that water out normally, which will probably take by Wednesday or Thursday, and then. You know, you, you can use your diuretics again on Friday, you know, to get any excess off your body. But probably by the end of the week, you should be pretty dry. I think people start going crazy or they stay on diuretics that whole week thinking, oh, I got to maintain this. But that's the worst thing you can do because then your body starts raising aldosterone levels. It starts fighting you. And it's very hard to get rid of water if you do that. So you have to kind of go through that peak, de-peak, let your body rebound a little bit. You're going to be on lower carbs anyway. You're not going to, you're going to go back to your contest diets at Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So you should deplete off that water, no problem. So it's a good question because a lot of people start doing crazy shit or they start doing, keep do, you know, it's like they, it's like they just continue what they've been doing, like with diuretics and, and, and contest dieting, you know, uh, like the carb up the whole week. You can't do that. You have to, you got to kind of deplete again and then recarb up and then you're going to look perfect. And once again, if you just duplicate what you did the week before, if it, if it worked right, you should get the same great results. Sometimes you even look better because you're drier. Now, these questions are from the Dave Palomo Experience app. If you download the app from your iTunes store or Android store, it's uh, $29 a month to join. You get everything I've ever written, all the writings, all my videos in one place. It's 
really well organized. You could also ask any questions you want on the app. It will appear in an open form so everyone sees everyone's questions and everyone's answers. So it's a really good learning experience. And then also I do a Q&A video, just like this Ask Dave, except an additional one just for the app members every single week. We put up a workout every single week. It's a really great resource. It's a way to keep learning about new stuff and, and keep refreshed. And uh, all my protocols are on there, my diets, my drug protocols. So it's a, it's a really, like I said, a great resource for learning. And you guys have really supported it over these last couple of years. And I, and I can't thank you enough. It's constantly growing. Uh, and thanks for that support. Let's go to our Facebook and Instagram questions again on Facebook. Just uh, type in RX Muscle in the search box on Instagram, wow. official underscore RX Muscles. Go to Jeff Such. What would you do if you had a client that had no strength difference between limbs on the right and left side while performing unilateral exercises, but one arm or leg looks visibly larger and more developed than the other side? Should intensity, volume, or frequency be increased on one side versus the other, or would you utilize a different approach to balance their physique? Well, it seems like the person did their research and watches this show because, you know, I, the one thing I always tell people when you have a disparity from one side to the other is to do the unilateral movement so that every arm and every you know limb is working independently of the other one. Because when you do compound movements, invariably the stronger side is going to dominate. Even if you fully focus on the, on the weaker side and don't even think about the, the, the strong side, you're still going to, you know, you're going to get some unequal uh, pressure is being exerted. So if you do things unilaterally, then whatever you do with this arm, you're going to do with this arm. The problem is genetically, one arm and one leg is always better and stronger and bigger than the other one. So you might have to do a little extra, a couple extra sets for the weaker side and really focus on that. Uh, that's just, you know, genetics. No one is perfectly symmetrical. Uh, even, you know, it's funny because my arms measured the same thing, but my one bicep was bigger than the other bicep and one tricep was the opposite tricep was bigger than the, so it kind of balanced itself out. So when, you know, when you throw your arms up, they look even, but you know, I know that, that they're not symmetrical, but for as long as the judges can't tell that you're asymmetrical, then, then there's nothing to worry about. But if you're doing unilateral already, you're pretty much doing everything you need to do. Maybe, like I said, throw an extra set or two in there for that weaker side. Let's go to Tommy Walsh. Um, question about Samson Dowda, obviously just coming off his two appearances at the Arnold US and the Arnold UK. Um, he's competed a lot, and that's something that you've noted um, over the you know course of the last couple of months in our preview segments going into the Arnold. Uh, so the question is, do you think he should skip the remaining shows, give his body a complete rest, then prepare for the Olympia? Um I mean, I guess the counter to that, because the other side of the discussion that I've heard over the last few days is that, again, the window for a bodybuilder is such where it is so small, capitalize on the opportunities. Where do you stand on that? Well, I mean, Samson just made a lot of money, you know, already over the last couple of months. He's done 13 shows in, I think, 18 months or something like that, or whatever Milos's figure was. He's he's pretty much banked enough money, I think, at this point. I think he has nothing to prove. The Arnold and the and the Olympia are where he needs to do his proving. And he took second in both Arnold's. Nothing to be ashamed of. Hottie was great. He still cashed in and made some good money for himself. He should shut it down till the Olympia at this point. There's no reason. I'm sure he'll probably do the Olympia and then the post-Olympia shows, some of those European shows like he did this past year. I think that's a good move on his part, especially because he, you know, he won a few of those and, and got some, I think he won them all or whatever, the ones he did. Yeah. And he made some good money. So, I mean, I think that that's smart. And, you know, the thing about Samson is his body doesn't look tired to me. I can usually tell when a body's tired, which means that he hasn't really peaked himself yet. So, and it could be the fact that he hasn't really hit that level of conditioning that we're all expecting from him. So his body is not that depleted. Maybe if he got to that point where he was ultra shredded and there was not a single morsel of fat on his body, at that point, he might have needed the break, but I don't think he ever took his body that to that extreme. Hopefully, we'll see that at the Olympia now, and then he can shut it down after that and take a little break. But I, I think he he did the right thing. He he looks he gets better from every show. He doesn't really look like I said have a tired look to his physique. He still has snap to it. He's mentally in a good place. So congratulations to him. He, you know he cashed in. There's, I don't think there's any other shows that it really pays for him to do this year. New York is stacked. He, you know, all he can do is lose there. There's no, there's no win. If he wins, well, he's supposed to win. If he loses, then to Nick Walker or something like that, that's not good for his for his um, momentum. So, I, and I don't think he needs the the twenty five grand or whatever. I think Steve said it might be up even higher than that. I don't want to misquote, but 
he doesn't need that money. He's already banked his money. He should shut it down, relax, make the improvements he needs now over the next couple of months, and then get ready for the Olympia. So that, that, that's my opinion. I, I, I tend to believe that that's probably what he's going to do too. Let's go to Christian Raven. Is there any treatment, drug, supplement that can treat a cartilage damage worn out knee? Uh, after many years, heavy squats and hard work, I guess, has taken its toll. Yeah, you know, uh, look, I had the same thing with my shoulders. It's, uh, you know, first of all, if, if you're taking arthro, you should be taking my arthrolyze formula, uh, at least five pills twice a day with food. That will definitely give you more life to that knee. It will, it will increase lubrication in the joint because if the dosages of the ingredients that are in there, you're going to start producing more synovial fluid, which is going to help lubricate that joint. So even though you might be close to bone on bone or you might be bone on bone, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make it more tolerable for you. Also, it's going to help with the regeneration of, of some of the cartilage that's left. You can't replace the cartilage that's gone, even with stem cells. Stem cells are not going to make new cartilage where, where there is none anymore. It might help the cartilage that's there put a nice little thin lip on it, but um, it's really not going to do anything for that. Pers personally, I would do the ortholyze. You might even want to do three pills three times a day uh, at this point because that's going to extend the life of that knee. Eventually, you'll probably need a knee replacement if you're, if you're bone on bone. And the longer you can put it off, the better. I mean, if you're in pain and you're limping, though, that I would just get it done. Um, the arthralized formula that I, you know, invented probably for myself, more so for myself. I, I, I waited 18 years for I needed a, a shoulder replacement 18 years earlier than I got it. So it, it definitely extended my life. I probably could have gotten it done a little earlier, but it definitely made it tolerable. I was able to train, you know. Granted, I don't walk on my shoulders, so you're you know you're working on walking on that knee, which is going to make it a little more difficult for you. It might make that wear and tear go a little faster, but you got to take a joint replacement product. You know, DECA helps too. I don't know if you're on anabolics. He didn't really say. Um, even 50, 100 milligrams a week of DECA will definitely make a big difference, and in in, also in the level of inflammation uh, that it will reduce. You'll you'll be more out of pain. I think even some BPC one five seven will help out as well. If you're doing two hundred micrograms a day. Right into right around that area, put it right under like the into the skin around the knee. That absolutely can help as well. So I think if you do those three modalities, the arthrolyze, the BPC one five seven, and a little bit of deca, I think you're going to see some. It'll extend the life of that knee at least. This question from Syed Shah um, about Ramadan. So what I'm going to do is because Dave did a full comprehensive years ago, he did a full yeah. comprehensive video um, on training and nutrition, getting it all in. Like um, and having an optimal Ramadan for bodybuilders. I'm going to put the tag right up here on the screen. So you watch that full, full video. Um, Dave's uh, guidance for bodybuilders during the month of Ramadan. Um, we haven't gotten a question in a while regarding terkesterone. So if you want to maybe give a refresher, it's from Alan Minch. Says he doesn't buy into the hype at all. Your thoughts on terkesterone? Yeah, I, I think you guys know my, my I already said it. I don't buy into all those st sterols and stuff like that. They're just, there's nothing, they're nothing compared to testosterone. You know what, Turk, <laughs> it sounds like testosterone. And I think that's, that's the marketing angle. And I know some people were selling it out there and, and then they were proven to, that it wasn't even in, the product wasn't even in what they were selling. I, that's not where, even where I was going, even with the real stuff, it just doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't provide the, uh, the effects that they're promising. Um, and, you know what? If you're going to do, if you look, if if you really want to improve improve performance, okay, and you don't want to go the anabolic steroid route for whatever reason, maybe you can't access them, or maybe you just don't want to do it, or maybe you you know you're a police officer or something like that, and you get tested, you know, at least try. I would go the peptide route first. I mean, at least these are tried and true. You can get them from clinics like Titan Medical. You know, they sell IGF one. They have you know um, a lot of different growth hormone releasing peptides. Uh, that are actually on sale right now too. So I would go that route first. Um, you're not going to get the results you're looking for from what the, they're promising from from these sterile compounds. It's just not. They're just not there. You know, I don't. I don't want to like bad. Everyone gets mad when I bad mess up. I just don't think it's worth the money. You know, and I think you're wasting your money. It's it's more of a marketing ploy. But you know, try it if you want. You know, and then you can tell me what you think. I I just think if you're going to do something you're better off going the peptide route first. And then if you know what, if you say I have nothing against steroids at all, then, then, then do that. If that's what you want to do, that's, it's, it's a personal decision. You know, a lot of people get really good results just from TRT levels of, of testosterone. 
And if you're at that level where you just feel like you're plateauing and you need a little kick me up and you and your and your testosterone is really not that high when you do blood work, get on some HRT. I, you'll see more results from that than from anything else you could possibly take. I can guarantee that. Uh, let's go to pulling up a question about uh, Eloquis. Um, so it's from B Wayne says he's currently taking Eloquis. Yeah. Are there any supplements he should avoid such as pre-workouts, creatine, multivitamins, or omegas, anything he should not be taking while on Eloquis? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they don't want you taking stuff that incre in, in, uh, increases clotting time. And I mean, increases bleeding time more, I believe. Um, you know, the problem with Eloquis is that, you know, and a lot of people have to take it because they have clotting issues. And they had wanted me to take it like after my, I actually, I think I was on it a little bit for, um, after my surgeries, uh, for both my shoulder. Uh, and then they did it again when I had the heart surgery and, you know, I already don't bleed very, you know, but what I, cause I take, you know, fish oils and omega lies obviously has a lot of fish oil and vitamin E, you know, the, all those, all those supplements make you not clot, which is good because you don't want to throw a clot right and die. So when you add something like Eloquist, it could make it to the point where you, if you bang into the wall, you know, you're going to get a bruise on your leg. You know, so you have to be careful sometimes if, if you add too much fish oil or too much vitamin E, it could make you prone to, you know, to, to, to bleeding too much. So those are the only real supplements you have to worry about. Most pre-workouts won't interact with them and, and most other supplements really are not going to be a problem. Now, obviously you don't want to jack your blood pressure through the roof either. You know, you blow a blood vessel in your brain or something like that and you'll bleed out. So other than doing stupid, crazy stuff, I think most supplements are very safe to take with Eloquist. And there are, I, I know that I don't think they want you to take vitamin K with it. So there are a couple, if you Google it, they, they'll tell you don't exceed this much uh, of this nutritional supplement when you're on Eloquist. And, you know, you're going to get, obviously, if he's on that uh, anticoagulant, he's going to be getting regular blood tests. So they'll tell him if, if his bleeding time is too high. And then if, you know, if you are taking, say, like omega lies or something like that, they, they might say, you know, cut it back a little bit. Or they may say, you know what, you're fine. You're, you're, you're in the right level. You're, you're, your clotting time is where we want it. And, and, and you're good to go. I know that when, when, I, when I'm on fish, when I'm on omega lies and I'm on all my supplements and I go for like a bleeding time test, which is a PT or INR test, they'll test you for your, how long it takes for your blood to clot. I'm super high, which means it takes a long time for my blood to clot, which is, which means you're not going to throw clots, but it, you don't want to do surgery when you, when you can't clot, because if you do surgery, you, you're going to, you know, you're going to never going to stop bleeding. So there's a fine line between what you want when you're not getting surgery and what you want when you are getting surgery, when you're getting surgery, that's why they make you stop your nutritional supplements and any kind of blood thinners like that two weeks before, because they want your body to be able to clot. When you're not in having surgery, you don't want to clot because you don't want to throw a clot in your, in your, in your coronary arteries. You don't want to throw a clot in your brain. You get a stroke. So um, I think that uh, what I would do is I would just, you know, talk to your physician about what you are taking and just make sure that your clotting, your bleeding time, excuse me, is uh, appropriate. Let's go to a Turok. Uh, Anivar Troch is more effective and less liver toxic than an Anivar pill. You know, I was I was just discussing this the other day with the HRT uh, person clinic, and they would and we you know let's say you do a troche, which is something all a troche is is like a it's like a big wafer you put under your tongue a lot of times, and it'll some of the drug gets absorbed sublingually. Now, how much is debatable? I I always thought that it wasn't really very much. Like I thought it was on of the order of ten to fifteen percent. What I'm told, at least from the clinic, was that it's it's up to fifty percent. So. If you absorb 50% in through your buccal membrane, through the blood vessels under your tongue, essentially, then only 50% you're swallowing, which means your liver only has to break down at 50% once, you know, whereas normally if you swallow the whole pill, you're going to, you're going to have to break down the pill twice, once when it goes through the digestive tract, and then once when the pill is ready to stop working and your liver breaks it down. So theoretically, it should be a lot, lot less toxic. The problem is that Anivar is really not that toxic to begin with. So I, you'd be better off doing a, an anadrol or D-ball troche, which they don't make as far as I know. That would be a better, a better version because those are really toxic drugs. So if you can get some of that in through your uh, buccal membrane and not through the, the digestive system, that would help out. But I don't think drugs like Anivar or Winchell are very toxic anyway. But if, if it's an option, like I know with a lot of HRT clinics, they do offer those troches 
I would go with that option. There's nothing, there's no harm in it. I mean, like I said, whatever you don't absorb under your tongue, you're going to swallow it anyway and you're going to absorb it. So there's no harm, no foul there. Let's go to a big ant. This question is fairly vague. Um, it's about best advice for bodybuilding after the age of 50. We do get this question fairly often. So if you can answer, I guess, a couple of different approaches. One would be for the bodybuilder who's still fairly new, maybe up to a little in age as they get or across 50 years old. And then the other part of it is for a bodybuilder that's been lifting for quite some time, bodybuilding yeah. for quite some time. Uh, how would you approach the, both yeah. cases as they approach and past 50? You know, I'll I can talk about myself. You know, I, I you know I limited once I had my shoulder replacements done and I could lift and do anything I want. Okay, before that, it's not a good a good example because I was limited on what I can do. Since now I can pretty much do anything I want in the gym, I found that it's better to actually, you know, do all the exercises I normally do. I like I love free weight lifting. I, you know, it's it's funny. I'll just bring this up, but I was in up in Tampa and I, and I ran into, and I went to a crunch fitness up there and I ran into Kamal El Gargney and, uh, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. We, we were talking and, and I ran into another guy too. And he was like, you know, you still train, like you're doing free weight movements and you're, you're doing all the hardcore basic movements. I said, yeah, because I love that. I love to lift like that. To me, machines are so boring. You know, Kamal, you know, Kamal, he's like, I'm the same way. I really love the free weight movements, you know? We all do machines as maybe a second or third movement, but for the first movement, you know, you really want to do, you know, free weights because it just gives you a more complete development. What I don't do, like that I did in the past, is I don't push myself to weights where I'm, I'm like, you know, laying it on the line, so to speak. Like when I was in, in my 20s and 30s, I was like, I was saying prayers before I was getting under the weights because it was, it was, it was heavy, it was scary. I don't do that anymore because you know why? I don't want to get hurt and I don't want to tear things. And when you get a little older. Things are, are not as resilient, and you, you can get hurt. And at this point, what do I need to tear a pec for, or tear a bicep for? I'd rather just back off the weight a little bit when I feel like maybe I'm just going a little too heavy. So that's how I've modified my training. So I'm still doing the same workouts I did 20 years ago. I'm just not doing as heavy a weight. I still do lower volume, high intensity, and I try to challenge myself. I don't do weights that I, that's a joke. You know, I, I, I constantly increase the weights if I need it, but I'm not I'm – not, you know, like I said, I'm not asking someone to come over and spot me because I think I'm only going to get one rep on, a, on, on an exercise. I'm not doing that. And, and I think that's just a smart way to lift. Now, if I was still competing, you know, maybe I would push a little bit more. And if I didn't have any injuries or any, you know, things that I was dealing with, I might have a different mindset on that. And I think that's fine. But I think you also have to take into account the fact that as we get older, you're going to be more prone to injuries. It's just just the way it is. The tendons are not as resilient. The muscles are not as resilient. The recovery is not as, as good, even if you're on anabolics. So just take that into account. Is it worth, you know, getting a major injury that you're going to have to recover from? If you don't care and you want to lay, roll the dice, then, then do it. But I think it's silly after the age of, you know, at, at a certain age that, you know, I just want to look good and feel good at this point. You know, I don't need to have 22-inch arms anymore, but it's nice to have a nice arm to throw up, you know, and, and, and look good, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. And my body fat's low, so I feel good about myself. And I think that there's nothing wrong with that training. I'll always train. I mean, I'm, I'm trained hard in the gym. I just don't go to the point of, of, you know, risking injury. Jeff Devnikar, best appetite suppressant for pre-contest, if there is any. I'm assuming he means like a natural, you know, uh, appetite suppressant uh, because there are, there are obviously prescription ones. I mean, you can use Manjaro, Ozempic. I mean, those are, those are the, probably the most uh, popular right now. You know, they kind of slow the transit of food through the digestive tract, and and you, your appetite is not as high. I don't like things like you know stimulants or you know like dexedrine and all these diet pills that that kill appetite. They're really bad for you. I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend using them. My, believe it or not, my my fat, my stimulant free lipolyze formula has a, an appetite suppressant. And the way that works, believe it or not, is that you know we all have a, we when we eat meals, we produce a hormone known as leptin. And leptin basically tells the body you're not hungry anymore. The problem is that the heaviest and most overweight people have the highest leptin levels, which doesn't make sense because their body is trying to tell them, hey, stop eating. And, and, and for some reason, their, their bodies are not responding. And the problem they found is that their leptin receptivity or the receptors for leptin are bad in their body. So they have all this, their brain's cranking out leptin and say, stop freaking eating. You're turning us into a, you know, a fat pig. And the body receptors just can't, you know, the brain receptors can't understand it. So 
the way one of the ingredients in lipolyse helps sensitize leptin receptors so that they work better. And so that's why a lot of people get, you know, some nice appetite suppression. And it doesn't suppress you like where you don't want to eat anything. It just, it takes away that, that urge to constantly eat because that's what leptin does. It takes away, after meals, it allows you to, all right, not to be so hungry. And then as your body goes through the next two, three hours, then you start building up hunger again. And that's the way it should be if you have normal re leptin receptivity. A lot of people don't. So lipolyze works really well. One pill three times a day. Sometimes we, we bump it up to five pills a day. And it just it helps restore normal leptin sensitivity. Because a lot of people have weird, poor leptin sensitivity. And all that means is bad leptin receptors. Let's go to a BA85 Muz or Muz. Uh, thoughts on taking Clen with caffeine before cardio. Is there any issues? Caffeine pill is 200 mg of the ingredient. Uh, thanks as always for your content. So caffeine, just caffeine pills. Is that what he said? Caffeine with, with Clen before, oh, with Clen. before cardio. Yeah. yeah it, it, it's, you know, a lot of people think that Clenbuterol is like a stimulant, makes your heart beat faster and stuff like that. It really isn't. The reason why people think that is the first two weeks that you take Clenbuterol, you get a little, a little shell shock. You get a little shakiness to it. And it's not really a stimulant effect. It's more of just like a, like your whole nervous system is a little traumatized by it. And, and, and no one knows why, but it kind of goes away after about two weeks. So if you can get through the first two weeks of it, it it's, it's fine. Now, if you take too much clenbuterol in one dose, like I always tell people, make sure you only take 20 micrograms per dose. You could take up to six doses a day, you know, if you build up to it, obviously. But you don't take them all at once, okay? Why? Well, clenbuterol has no effect on the heart because it doesn't affect beta-1 receptors, which are on the heart. It's only a beta-2, and I, they think beta-3 stimulant. But what happens is, Clenbuterol also drops blood pressure because it dilates blood vessels. And when it dilates the blood vessels and the, and the pressure drops, if you drop it too severely because you're taking too many at one time, your heart has to beat faster to pump that blood through the body. Otherwise, your, your blood pressure is too low. When that happens, you can start feeling your heart beating a little faster. And that's why your heart rate would go up. So the heart rate only goes up on clenbuterol when you take too much at one time. If you spread it out, you're not going to get that, you're not going to get that effect. So taking caffeine with Clenbuterol is not going to make the clenbuterol, you know, make your heart beat faster because it's not making your heart beat to begin with. So if anything, uh, caffeine raises blood pressure a little bit, so it might even out the clenbuterol effect a little bit. So you can take, you know, clenbuterol and caffeine together. I mean, I wouldn't recommend enormous amounts, but but you can do it safely and, and, and not have anything to worry about. Um. Let me, all right, yeah, Chester Brown. Uh, <clears throat> what is your recommendation for combining T3 and Clen as part of a cutting cycle? Says he'll be using Test and Equipoise as well. Yeah, I, I like that combination. I think it works really, really well. And, you know, I was, I was having a conversation also when I was do, the other day with, when I was in this uh, rejuvenation clinic, and I was talking with a doctor there, and we were discussing how people really don't understand that, you know, T4, which is thyroxine, which is what the thyroid gland releases, is just not an active thyroid hormone. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't matter how much T4 you put into your body. It will not cause any side effects because your body will only convert what it needs into T3, which is the active thyroid metabolite. That's just the way it is. So when you're dieting a lot of times, sometimes T4 to T3 conversion will slow down because your body knows it's burning itself up. It's burning through stored body fat. It get, sometimes it can get panicky, especially if you're on low carbs for long periods of time. So adding a little T3 to the mix, okay, to kind of, which overrides that T4, you don't have to worry about the T4 to T3 conversion because you're taking the T3. It automatically increases, you know, metabolism. Now, obviously, if you take too much T3, that's not good because then you could risk losing muscle. But, you know, assuming you're taking like steroids or, or, or clenbuterol or GH, you, that, that usually spares the muscle tissue. That's why people don't really lose muscle on that. But if you did take too much, you can certainly risk getting side effects from it. So usually people take in a dosage anywhere from 25 micrograms up to 100 micrograms per day. And that seems to be well, very well tolerated because it still keeps you in the normal level. Now, the good thing about T3 is if you take a little too much um, you know, within that range, as I'm saying, your body might not need it. So it'll just shut down some of its natural you know, conversion of T4 to T3. So you, it's hard to OD on T3 unless, like I said, you're taking massive amounts of it. And most people don't do that. Every once in a while, you hear a horror story about someone thought they were taking a 25 microgram pill and they were actually taking a 100 microgram pill. But other than that, a mix up in dosage, it's relatively safe. Now, when it, it seems to stack really well with clenbuterol, so if you're doing the clenbuterol, 
at the same time, you get a better uh, fat burning effect from it. It's a good synergism. It's good for women, especially because there's no androgenic side effects because they're not they're non steroidal. They're not they don't have any androgenic side effects because they're just not steroidal compounds. So uh, a lot of women use that to get in shape, you know, and 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 men as well. But I'm just saying it's something that women can use safely and not have to worry about it. Once again, you have to know how to apply it and how to gradually increase it. And that's why it's good to work with a coach who has experience with that. I mean, I, I, yep. I use that with a lot of clients on a regular basis, and, and we have very good results. I'm glad we got this question because very often uh, we talk about suffering, right? And yeah. in many of the roundtable discussions that you we've had on this channel um, – especially the contest previews that that conversation has always come up, whether today's athletes are quote unquote suffering hard enough. So that of flex wants to know that says he keeps hearing this reference to suffering when in contest prep, is that regarding being hungry all the extra time for training, posing cardio, or is it all the above? Just wondering what it is meant by quote unquote suffering. If you don't know what it means, you haven't, <laughs> you haven't done it. Can you click me? Up? Oh, there we go. Yeah, if you don't know what it means, you haven't done it. I can I can promise you that because if you if you've done it, you know you know what suffering you know what suffering is. It's you know Dorian Yates said it best. I saw a post he put up the other day, a picture of him from behind. It was it was like a it was a stage. Someone took a photograph of him. He was standing from the front on stage, but it was a picture from behind. You can just see how lean he was from behind. And he said, you know, I probably could have competed ten, maybe even fifteen pounds heavier than I did. But I always wanted to come in the most possible shredded I possibly could to show the most detail. He said, whereas guys today tend to not, you know, sacrifice losing a pound or two of muscle and they come in bigger and fuller because they think that's a better look. And he just felt that, you know, the more chiseled look was the way to go. And I happen to agree with him. I was always a guy who liked to go for that chiseled look as well, even if I sacrificed a pound or two of muscle. It didn't matter because I wanted to. I wanted to get that extra, extra graininess because I think that that just shows a level of of perfection on stage that the judges can't take their eyes off. And I think that's why Hadi Chopin does so well because he has that same chiseled, chiseled look. He can, we know he can come in bigger. He did it for the Olympia, and he wound up losing the Olympia to Derek Lunsford. So it didn't work for him. Bigger is not better if it's not if if the quality is is not there. So. When you go to that point where you're where to get to lose that little extra bit of body fat, we're, we're talking like the five, the four percent body fat to the two percent body fat jump, because most people can compete at four percent look great, but if you go to the two percent, okay, to lose that little extra bit, it's 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 torturous because you have it's like you're running on fumes all day long because you're basically existing from meal to meal. There's no stored anything, and it, you're just miserable all the time. And a lot of people don't want to go to that place. They they think that. First of all, they convince themselves they're going to lose muscle, even though they're on 10 different anabolics, you know, which is not going to happen, obviously. And if they don't convince themselves they're going to lose muscle, they, the, the other you know, group of people that can't do it, it's because it's just too much pain and suffering. It just doesn't feel good. And a lot of people don't like to endure that kind of un uncomfortableness, and they wind up succumbing to cheating or eating a few extra bites of here and there. And, and, and you know, if you, if you cheat, you're never going to lose that last 2% of body fat. You have to really suffer. And Lavroni said it best too. He would do he would do vegetables and protein, you know, for six weeks straight to get himself into the best shape of his life. And that's that's how you get that sucked out, hollowed out face. You get that bony skeleton skull. If I don't see that on a competitor, I know that they, they didn't suffer that much. You know, when I see those full cheeks and then they and smiling too much, that means that they they probably didn't go to that place that they needed to go to. If you looked at Dorian's and Ronnie's face, they always had those hollowed out cheekbones, and that's showed me that they were suffering more than anything you know, to get to that place. I mean, think about it. Ronnie Coleman had more muscle than anyone. He was doing two and a half hours of cardio a day. How many guys do that today? Guys complain if they have to do more than 30 minutes, they think they're going to lose muscle. You know, didn't look like Ronnie lost any muscle. You know, so it, that's what I mean by suffering. You, you can't be afraid to go to that place where, you know, you just feel horrendous and every instinct in your body is telling you, this is probably not the right thing to do because I'm going to lose muscle. I'm going to lose this. I'm not going to look good. You got to go there. You have to go there if you want to be the best. Um, we, ha we have gotten this kind of a question in a variety of ways from Bilal Hamidi about splitting up leg day, splitting up leg day into two. So he's asking, meaning one day for quads and another day for hamstrings as opposed to a regular full leg day. Is that something you recommend? So I know somebody else previously had asked about you know, putting calves on their day as well. 
Yeah. I, I used to do calves on a different day than legs because I just thought it was too much. But and it really they're not connected. You're not using really a lot of calves when you're doing, you know, the, the, the upper quad, you know, movements. But I don't have a problem with splitting it. I personally like to do legs all in one shot on one day a week. But I have split it up in the past and, and experimented with that. And, you know, sometimes it's nice to take a break for just for a break to, to do it. I'll do it for a couple of weeks and then, you know, go back. But I always, I, I find that when you're doing like leg presses and squats, you're using quads and hamstrings and glutes. It's, it's impossible to isolate it. So if you're doing an extra day of, of hamstring work, okay, you're just doing an extra day of hamstring work. You're not, it's not like you're isolating the hamstrings on one day and the, and the quads on another day. Every, when you do compound movements, you're using the entire leg, the adductors, the, the quads, the hamstrings, the glutes, all the assister muscles, the, the, uh, the adductor muscles. So I think the abductor muscles too. So, I mean, it's impossible to separate them. If you want to do an extra day because you think you need more work on your legs and you think it's going to help, you can try it, but sometimes it can make it worse. So I'm just, you know, I'm just saying if you're going to do it, I wouldn't do it all the time. You might want to do it for four weeks in a row and then, and then go back to doing legs once a day. That's probably a better way to, to, to rotate it around. Take a couple of more quick hitters from Isaiah Jones. Is it possible to be getting lean, loose fat without the scale not changing weight when diet and training is on point? Lean, loose fat? Is that what he said? No, no. So is it, is it possible to be getting lean, to be losing fat oh. without the scale not changing weight, assuming everything is on point? Yeah, I mean, you, some people put muscle on while they're, while they're growing, you know, excuse me, while they're leaning out. So I, that's why I always have my clients send me pictures too. So I, yes, I do have them weigh in. I do ask them how much weight they've lost or gained from the previous update, but they also send me pictures. So if I look at the pictures and I think I know that they look better, even though they might have gained two pounds, I don't have a problem with it. Okay. But if they gain two, three pounds and they say, I, 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 I feel like I'm, I'm leaner and I look at the pictures and I know they're not, I'm not going to blow smoke up their ass. I'm going to tell them you look, you you blew it this week somehow, you know, let's figure out what you're doing wrong. So it is possible. People do it, you know, especially a lot of like, especially women who don't use any anabolics all year round, they'll, they'll start anabar or something like that for a contest prep and they'll start growing the first, you know, six weeks and the scale's not moving barely at all. And they're all panicking. And I'm like, look, you, you look better every single update. You're getting abs, you're just putting on muscle. So that is a reality. But if you're doing like an off season of a big stack of drugs and then you go into pre-contest and you're not losing weight, it's probably not that you're putting on muscle. It's probably that, you know, you need to alter the diet a little bit. So you have to kind of figure out what's, what the problem is. If you look better, don't worry about it. If you're not looking better and your weight's not moving, then you're probably eating too much food, you know, or maybe you're not doing enough cardio or what something's wrong. And that's why that's where a coach comes in and they will diagnose that and figure it out. Last one from uh, Alexander Ruin coach. If someone who finished your keto diet and wants to jump straight into an off season plan, uh, they straight away go with the measurements you recommend or slowly add the carbs and protein in. You know, I've said this before. And I think it, it, it's worth mentioning again. What happens is in order to gain weight, you have to eat an exorbitant amount of food over your maintenance level. In order to lose weight, you have to eat a, a lot less food than your maintenance weight. So there's two extremes. So when you go from contest prep, Okay, and now you want to start growing, just getting back to maintenance levels of food sounds like it would be enough, right? Because you haven't eaten any carbs and now you're eating 180 grams of carbs or 200 grams of carbs a day. That should be enough. A lot of times those carbs will speed your metabolism. You start losing weight. So you do have to probably go to the other extreme and, and make sure that you're getting enough that not only will handle your maintenance level, not only will handle the increase in metabolic rate, but will also be extra enough to help fuel you through the new muscle gain. So that's a trial and error thing. Everyone's a little different, but I do go from, I do go from, you know, usually after a show's over, I'll give these guys like two weeks and I'll, I'll inch up their carbs. I might go to right to, to 200 grams, see how they do on that. If they look flat and they're, and they're burning through those carbs, then I increase them. Obviously, if they're maintaining well, we'll keep them on that. It, it's a trial. Everyone's completely different. You can't, I, it's not one size fits all. Some people's metabolism go absolutely lun, lunatic crazy after a contest prep and those people you have to feed them i and i don't, and you can't even feed them clean carbs you have to give them like burgers and fries and stuff like that to kind of feed that metabolism that's why another reason why it's good to have a coach because they can help you decide what you should and shouldn't be doing that's going to do for this episode of ask dave right now on the channel all new episode of after hours the after hours podcast a heated debate on the upcoming mike tyson uh jake paul fight and um 
I guess, all the different variables, betting variables in between as well. All new episode of the new show, Confessional, Lee Priest and Jimmy the Bull. Uh, a heavy Muscle Radio recap of this past weekend's Arnold UK. Um, and then obviously all of our coverage from the live reaction show that we had from the Arnold UK. If you haven't already done so, subscribe below, hit the notification bell. If you like what you're watching, hit the like button, comment below. And as always, we appreciate all of your support. For Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next time.